And we are live, episode number 239, Better on Draft Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate each and every one of you. I know Nick's going to be joining us in just a minute. He had a prior engagement, and I know we're going to be celebrating because he's got some big news to announce today. today. Uh, but going over all of the uh, guests, Wendy, or guests, guests, or host, Jesus, it is Friday. Wendy, how are you, and what are you drinking? <laughs> Uh, I am doing fantastic. I'm very happy that it's Friday, and I did not have to ask once what day it was today. Um, I am drinking uh, one of my favorites. It's actually one of my go-to's, the Salted Caramel Porter from Pigeon Hill. Okay. Rob, what's up? What do you uh, you got going on over there, and what are you drinking? Uh, Not much going on. Just getting through through the week, just like everybody else, and kind of glad that, uh, you know, most of it is is over, although, you know, one good part about it uh, was Tuesday was uh, Dina and I's uh, fourth wedding anniversary. So we're mm. happy to have been celebrating that. Um, unfortunately, we went to a restaurant that undercooked my steak and completely undercooked her gnocchi, which I don't understand how you undercook gnocchi at all. But uh, yeah, it basically, it just tasted like cold potatoes, which was which was ridiculous. Oh, that's no good. So, Rob, hold on. How do you how do you undercook steak? I don't understand. I, I don't either. There's no such thing. I I asked for medium, and they went medium rare, with a bit more rare than than what medium should be. So I'm guessing they probably had already seared it too and didn't want to do anything. But uh, what are you drinking over there? Uh, I am drinking right now. I've got a couple of things with me right now in the glass with my uh, 4-0 Pittsburgh Steelers is uh, Precious Cargo from um, Five Shores, which is a uh, IPA that is uh, with passion fruit and pineapple. And also I cracked open, got a couple more left of these. Uh, of course, in my Black is Beautiful glass is a Firestone Walker's Cherry Barrel Blossom which is their uh, Imperial Smoked Porter with sea salt, Asian bourbon barrels, and cherry bitters barrels. All right. Well, Dan, you're over in Arizona. Has it uh, broke 90 today? Yeah, we're on day 145 of it being over 100 degrees. Jesus Uh, Christ. It's a new record as of Wednesday because it didn't break 100 yesterday. Well, what what are you drinking to cool down? uh, I'm sticking with the liquor theme I've been going with for a while. Got the old uh, Bloody Mary with the um, New Amsterdam vodka in it, then got to go with the vodka soda because why not chase liquor with some more liquor? I feel like you're (laughs) going to need to start at least getting out past New Amsterdam and get something more than just, you You know. know, I'm a pretty big uh, Kettle One fan. I almost grabbed some today. It's like, eh, you know, am I going to be mad if I drink a fifth of that on a Friday and then have to go get more? So that's why I stuck with the cheap stuff. That's fair. I mean, I'm I'm not a big fan of mixing good stuff. Um, so I I never mix like a good whiskey with Coca Cola. Like I'm just like, no, I just want fucking whiskey. Are you um, saying you wouldn't you wouldn't mix that fifty dollars shot you had? Oh uh, no, absolutely like, not. I would special K or whatever the Kmart brand. <laughs> I I <laughs> Cola special was. K <laughs> or whatever. It um, was. No, I would not mix Hibiki Seventeen with. Special K Cola um, or Diet Right or whatever else. Uh, uh, Royal Crown. Um, so I've got a, uh, a Pigeon Hill Oktoberfest and a Pigeon Hill Oktoberfest and a Pigeon Hill Oktoberfest. Now, the reason I have three of them is on here it says perfect for filling Das Boot. And I'm like, hmm. So I decided oh, no. to get my boot. <laughs> and I have a boot filled with Oktoberfest beer. Um, so as you noticed, me and Wendy are both drinking Pigeon Hill with a trend. You know who the guest is, so I'm going to bring him in. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and uh, what you do. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Michael from Pigeon Hill. I am one of the co-owners, co-founders, uh, director of legal sales and marketing uh, tonight, I'm also the doorman because we're opening up our new uh, our new auxiliary tap room. So I've been working the door until I ran up here to hang out with all of you. Well, I'm glad we could uh, give you a break. I know you are celebrating you. Sober October. Uh, we are going to be doing Dry January this year. We're lining up our guests right now. But you are drinking what? 
I am drinking Athletic Brewing's Run Wild uh, non-alcoholic IPA, which is actually a go-to for me even when I'm not not drinking. Um, thanks to uh, a certain Ashley Price who got me hooked on this a while ago. Uh, we even carry it at Pigeon Hill because I drink it when I'm in the brewery if I'm feeling like I maybe just need to stop having real beer. Now, you can actually go back and listen. We were able to get the uh, the interview with uh, the owners and head brewer of uh, Athletic Brewing. I was hoping the stalling long enough would allow the website to load for me to tell you what episode number it is. But it's obviously one of the previous episodes that we have. Um, so you can go check out that. Uh, how long has Pigeon Hill been open for? Uh, it's been, oh, geez, almost seven years now. So we opened March 21st of 2014. What was the first beer that you guys brewed over there? Uh, the first beer that we brewed on our, uh, our original three and a half barrel system was Walter Blondale, except we froze it. And uh, so it became Walter Goes to Iceland, which uh, we drank most of on our own. And the rest we threw into a Solera barrel. And that was our first bottle release on our first anniversary. It was our Sour Blondale. And that's you have Walter Gets Buzzed, I think, right now. Um, actually, we just retired Walter Gets Buzzed, and well, we didn't retire. We rebranded Walter Gets Buzzed as Cafe Disco. Um, I don't actually have a Cafe Disco can with me, but I have the pencil holder with the pretend paper label wrapped around it. So Cafe Disco is the new Walter Gets Buzzed, and we just shipped that this week. Awesome. I actually uh, was going to grab that beer until I saw the Oktoberfest hiding behind it at my local store. So I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm definitely it's the season. So I wanted to make sure to get it uh, prior to Pigeon Hill. How long have you been brewing for? Uh, me personally? Yes, I was a I, I was a terrible home brewer. Um, I started brewing in 2011 uh, with a friend of mine. And I made some of the worst home brews that anyone had ever tried. My family wasn't even kind enough to tell me it was good. Uh, but <laughs> most of most of my my business partners and um, everyone that brews for us came from the Muskegon Ottawa Brewers, and collectively, I think they had 30 years home brewing experience when we opened. Did you do a Mr. Beer Kit to start, or uh, did you have like your your eyes set on something that higher? <laughs> I wasn't that bad. I mean, it was it was a Northern Brewers. Kit, uh, that my wife bought me for, uh, I think for my birthday, uh, or maybe it was law school graduation or something. Um, and everything I made tasted like uh, it was just bad. My sanitation was not my forte. We'll just leave it there. That's definitely very fair. I've learned whenever I talk about home brewing and I talk to a brewer, they always say clean, clean, clean. That's the first like three things they talk about, like the best things to do when home brewing. I, I did a Northern Brewer kit, the uh, the Amber, um, and I, I think it was pretty solid for, you know, being a kit beer. Uh, I know a lot of the people in this chat were able to try it. So either they just lied to me or didn't. I do have uh, I think it's a Mr. Brew kit uh, from Rob in my refrigerator. That's got to be at least five years old. Um, so I'm excited <laughs> to try that one day. You mentioned law school, though. You're a lawyer. Yes. Um, I, uh, I <clears throat> graduated from law school. I went to uh, DePaul uh, University College of Law, graduated from there back in 2011, um, went to law school because my wife wanted to move to Chicago and I had a degree in philosophy and psychology and didn't know what else to do with myself, but knew I wanted to end up in this industry. And so I figured if I was a lawyer, I'd at least be marketable. And um, I practiced liquor law here in Michigan for uh, well, I guess technically I still practice kind of on the side, uh, but I practiced for a few years before Pigeon Hill opened up. And um, now that's I do a lot of our regulatory work, uh, just kind of leaning on that background. So that actually kind of with in terms of liquor law, that does make me kind of go into one question. Um, obviously, we see a lot of changes that have been happening in the state uh, in terms of laws and delivery and curbside, are there any things, any things in within the states, uh, other than what's happened right now, that you would like to see change? Um, oof, that's Remember, it's, like only, it's only a fifty-minute interview. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things, a lot of the things that I thought I wanted changed six years ago. I've come to appreciate in one fashion or another, and I've come to understand why the guild kind of has this stratified um, 
position. You know, what suits a brewery at 600 barrels doesn't necessarily work for a brewery at 3,000 barrels, doesn't necessarily work for a brewery at 30,000 barrels. And so I've had uh, kind of a tough time wrapping my head around what's really best for the industry as a whole. Um, one thing that I know I, I personally would like to see relaxed is the, uh, the prohibitions on cooperative advertising. Now they do to some extent protect smaller breweries because they stop say AB InBev from coming in and hijacking and saying, you know, we're going to, uh, we're going to pay for all of this and the retailers are all going to be on our side. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that we could do with some of our small independent local retail partners, um, just working together to advertise that we're advertise the fact that we're working together I mean, to, to advertise the fact that, you know, we we're collaborating that we can't do because of these prohibitions that are trying to separate the tiers. Uh, kind of a lawyer's non-answer. I apologize. <laughs> what I do. The good old tears. Well, I know one thing that that has helped, at least, um, you know, in the city there in, in Muskegon, uh, that, uh, that this really has certainly helped out. is that kind of that creation of the outdoor social districts, uh, which is obviously allowing the patrons to go to favorite bars, restaurants and breweries while staying outside. Because there's still a lot of people that are out there that are not comfortable with being in an indoor facility. Um, while that's great. Obviously, with where you're located, and we'll get to, for, for everyone who do not know where Muskegon is, we'll get to where they are, um, but with the fall temperatures and the winter temperatures, as most of us, yes, we do use our hands, uh, but those of us that, that are dealing with the fall temperatures and now the winter temperatures that are going to come up, um, I got to feel like that's going to put a damper on a lot of the patrons and consumers that are going to come out. So I guess I'm curious, um, I guess first, let everybody know uh, who are not in the state of Michigan, or maybe those who don't know, who are in Michigan, who don't know where you are, where you are, and what plans do you have going into the future, coming into these colder months, that are that is going to help in keeping you guys viable? Absolutely. Um, start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start with the social districts. Uh, they have been in indispensable for us. Um, I was actually lucky to be on a, a group that was uh, trying to promote those about two years ago. And, you know, those are one of the good things to come out of COVID. We actually had the legislature sit back and go, wow, this crazy idea is not so crazy right now. And so now we, we are starting to embrace the idea of open, I'd say open intox in the streets, uh, which when well controlled is phenomenal. You know, it, it's a blessing for downtown areas and tourist towns. Um, there are a few things that we're trying to do as a city and as Pigeon Hill to approach the, the looming winter. Uh, obviously, we get a lot more snow. We have a, uh, a, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, so a heck of a lot of wind. <laughs> and um, you can uh, swear. Uh, uh, Oh, we, we have a shitload of wind. <laughs> well, as, as as you know, in advertising, especially with alcohol, even though we're alcohol related um, and we're not like sell like we can't talk to anyone under 21. We have to be labeled explicit, like okay. 18 and All up, right. no matter what, just to start with. So I'm well, like, ah. there's there's a shitload of wind here in Muskegon and uh, it's cold. You know, I mean, we the lake effect is real here. Uh, that being said, one thing that I've been working with our chamber on, uh, actually all of us here at Pigeon Hill and uh, our downtown businesses have been working with our chamber on is trying to get people to embrace the outdoors. My wife started focusing on plowing our downtown bike trails about six years ago, um, actually started a nonprofit to do so because she, we went up to Marquette. We found out they're out hanging outside in the middle of the winter. They're plowing their bike trails and they're getting twice as much snow as us. I mean, it's, it's cold up there. It's just cold down here. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we're working on kind of getting folks to embrace the idea that it's okay to be outside in the middle of winter. We just have to dress differently. And then in addition to that, we, I mean, we're kind of pivoting. So we had a space that's directly below me, or well, it still is directly below me, um, that was a private event space before COVID. And the long-term plan for that was always kind of a, an auxiliary hangout space, a new tap room. And uh, as of tonight, that is our auxiliary tap room. We just open it for our club members only so that when we lose last week, the outdoor seating we had on Western Avenue, you know, where our main tap room is, we can start to shift and we have 50% occupancy across the street. 
and we have 50% occupancy here. And it creates two venues that are both intimate while being spaced out, where effectively we end up with the exact same seating that we had to start with. And that's for us really just get people to embrace being outdoors, but also work with what we got. All right. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that that definitely not only you guys but but a lot that are along that along that trail or, or the third coast is as we like to call it uh, that that have to deal with Lake Michigan and I kudos to you guys to, to be able to, to to have something to go through that. Um, uh, another thing that that uh, uh, I kind of wanted to go through is that uh, back in September, kind of shifting a little bit, uh, that Pigeon Hill started distributing to another state. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk to us about where those beers are now landing and why they are the lucky ones. Um, <laughs> well, uh, Mark Logos, who um, the name you're probably familiar with. Oh, yes. Nation. Yeah. Uh, so um, Mark and I, we've been talking for forever. I mean, Mark's been talking to everybody forever um, through social media. But, um, you know, Mark and I started talking a little more seriously uh, several months back. And he's, he had great connections outside of Michigan. Uh, he had done a lot of the legwork that I just didn't have time to do. And we had looked at going outside of Michigan about two years ago and realized that there was still a lot of untapped market here inside the state. And so we decided against it. We didn't want to put the time and effort really into, into that. And then when COVID hit, we kind of had to sit and re-examine everything. You know, we had to say, well, we want to be Michigan only. We want to be Michigan forever. But realistically we're yeah you, know, you you know what i did there uh i've always said we are michigan only michigan for now and um at the end of the day as long as we can take care of all of our accounts here in michigan and we can take care of everyone that wants pigeon hill in michigan we're willing to look outside the state and with draft sales getting caught like they were you know we we had excess capacity not a lot but we we did have excess capacity going into covid um, luckily, we're going to end the year up a little bit, but all of a sudden things got a lot more uncertain. And so we said, all right, you know, where else could we go just to have a little more cushion? And Mark approached me and said, well, you know, I've, I've got some great states. I've got some great partners I know. And so we said, well, start us off with your best bets. And Florida was on the list. And this is kind of silly, but we've got uh, one of our former bartenders lives in Florida and she is a rabid Pigeon Hill fan. Uh, she's still part of our family. And we have a lot of our club members that winter down in Florida who have been begging us to go to Florida. And we said, you know, that's a state where it seems very predictable. You know, the numbers we're looking at, we, we know we can hit. Uh, they're, they're good. They're not crazy. They're not going to take away from Michigan. It's, it's, it, it just aligns with what we want for organic growth. And so that's what we ended up going with. We, you know, we selected Florida because it, it kind of just fit that pattern of organic growth with a built-in audience we already knew. And uh, it's also really warm and we kind of hoped eventually we could travel there in the winter. Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, now, one thing that you, kind of to follow up with that, um, that in a previous interview, you had said that smart growth is more important than fast growth and that you're excited to keep making and exporting great Muskegon beer to everyone who wants it. What I want to know is, are there any other states that have been looking for your beers or are there states that you want to see Pigeon Hill grow in? Yes. Uh, To to both of those questions. Um, (laughs) Yes. And uh, that conversation was actually had this week. Uh, we, We kind of revisit that every week. And at this point, I don't want to say we're in a holding pattern, but effectively I'm in a holding pattern because we have had interest from other states and there are a few states that we're especially excited to go to um, when the time is right. Um, but we've had Salty Caramel Porter is now, I don't actually have my number. Well, here, I might have my numbers right here. As of yesterday, I think SCP is something, even the draft is up 45% over the same period last year. Uh, the 30 day period. And I mean, we did not expect that going into Florida, you know, to have SCP just explode once again, even in draft. And so I'm more happy to sit back and say, all right, we're taking care of Michigan again. And we'll see what this looks like in January. And then we can reevaluate. 
But I guess in, in taking care of, of Michigan, I believe, I, I guess, unless it's changed, is it still, what, what's the system that is in the original facility? And then like the, the new facility that you guys built uh, starting back in 2018, that's a 20 barrel system, right? Yeah, we've had the 20 barrel system since 2016. Um, we have the three and a half barrel system, which we moved over here. So both the three and a half barrel and the 20 barrel are here. Theoretically, we can do around 6,000 barrels on this system. Um, I mean, that's theoretical capacity. It's actually right. about 6,150. Uh, but then you figure, you know, realistically, in a great manufacturing world, you're at 85% capacity. That's practical capacity. And then you take into account the fact that we're dealing with a living organism and I'm happy to hit 75% capacity when I'm factoring. And, you know, I'm, I run, um, I do all of our projections. I do all of our forecasting, um, you know, every week today on Fridays, I tell the guys what to brew for the next week. And if I'm hitting 75, we're having a great month. And so, you know, even though we have that excess capacity, when we see these surges in say October, September, um, beer is just completely taking off. We need to be able to make sure that we're not going outside that range of our practical capacity and then shorting our Michigan distributors. Gotcha. All right. Uh, I think this is the, maybe the last one that I have. Um, okay. Now I know that not every brewery gets a medal, but Obviously, with you guys with Pigeon Hills, you guys got two medals back in, in 2017. Uh, it was one that was uh, – both of them were gold. One was the gold in the coffee beer cut category for Walter Gets Buzz, which, as you said, is now Cafe Disco. The other one was a gold in the urban spice category for Your Mom and French Toast, which is now Cinnamon on French Toast. Name changes. Um, in my mind, I always feel like the, the moment I get the taste of winning a championship of something that – I want to do it again. Do you guys have that same feeling? And is it like with, with medals, with breweries winning medals, does does it matter in the long term? Is it just kind of that short term, like attaboy feeling that you get? Or does it like go on like years and years that you want to try and do that again? I mean, I think that's a personal question for sure. Not, not, not that it's too personal. I, I think that really depends on the individuals and it depends on the brewery. For us, I think it was it was something we needed early on, especially because we had these urban spice beers taking off. And when we set out, you know, we were thinking we're going to make clean IPAs. Uh, Hazy's didn't even exist yet. And we're going to make clean IPAs. We're going to make Blondales. We're going to make lagers. And the next thing we know, we're making cookie beers, which um, I mean, that's that's what fueled what Pigeon Hill is now. And I think we struggled with that as an identity early on. And all of a sudden we won some medals and it made us think, oh, you know, it's not like, this is good. You know, we, we're actually, we're, we're doing a good job. And it, it wasn't just, you know, gratifying. It wasn't just a pat on the back. It, it actually made us feel like, hey, we've, we've accomplished something. We didn't do what we set out to do, but we're doing something right. And it feels good. And yeah. now, honestly, I don't think we care as much. Now it's just, <laughs> you know, do we like the beer? Let's drink it. Right. <laughs> I, I feel you had the – sorry, Dan. I'll let you go right after yep. this. Um, I feel that you kind of had the same thing that happened with uh, Travis over at Old Nation, um, speaking with Mark and Tra – like Travis was pure, true to style brewery. Like he, he is that brewer, and he makes a phenomenal beer. Like all of his beers that he makes is just on point, true to style, like perfect. And, you know, they, they at Old Nation were struggling a little bit, and when New England IPA hit – and he decides to make M43, it just explodes to the point where I, I think the big issue, and I think this is what saved his sanity, was when he launched um, Detroit M43. Because all of his tanks, when we went there for the road show um, back uh, two years ago, maybe, um, over at, or it might have been a year and a half ago, when we did the Aberrant, Becker, and Old Nation episode, um, you know, all those tanks at that time were just filled to the gills of M43. And he's like, I can't brew anything that I want to brew. Um, so I think, 
you know, for you guys, you guys are just like, okay, well, you know, we made it, uh, we made it with all these great beers. We'll just keep, you know, making beers that we like as opposed to sticking to it. I think for Travis though, it might've been a different story for the fact that, you know, I think, I think he still has that old guard mentality of, uh, uh, brewing. Um, Dan, I know you were going to say something. No, I was just curious, bringing up the medals, because, you know, GABF award ceremony is literally going on right now as we're recording this. Did you ever think to take your beers back to try and win the same medals again? Um, because I think to a couple of breweries here in Arizona that just keep doing it year after year and keep winning the gold, especially with the Scotch Ale that comes out of one of the breweries out here year after year, just keeps smashing everyone who tries to compete against them. Is that something you would try to do to see if your beer is still on par or if it's falling behind? Or are you just like, oh, we won one good enough, like kind of kind of like Ken will get this kind of like our team mad mentality back in the 90s. <laughs> no, we, we won one. Oh, we won man. one. Let, we'll just screw around um, for the next decade. <laughs> So this is to have the the head of sales and marketing tell you this is pretty terrible, but I don't know which ones we've won, but I know that mom has taken home two golds and a silver and a bronze, I think. And Walter gets buzzed has at least two golds. Nice. Um, So, I mean, they have won multiples. Um, We have never pulled in a GABF. I think, you know, talking about medals that would, that we still care about. The day we bring home a J- GABF is probably the day we just quit sending beer out for competitions. <laughs> we just done. <laughs> like, we're, right, we're, yeah, we, we're good. We're good. We'll call it a day. Um, <laughs> that is the one that I think is kind of like the, you know, it's the one you still want to put up on the shelf um, to show mom when she comes into the brewery. <laughs> but um, show mom. We, <laughs> we, we were sending out a lot. And I mean, there are still, there, there's no, that's nothing against those who still send out to a lot of competitions because um, you know, I think it's a great way to kind of get feedback on your beer, really objective feedback. But uh, we did kind of dial back on what we were sending to. And it got to the point where I was like, you know, we haven't won a GABF let's keep going there. And then, you know, let's let the consumer decide from that point on, do we think it's good? Does the consumer think it's good? If so, we're happy. I feel I feel with GABF, and I'm going to ask you this question because I've been reading uh, Barrel Age Stouts and Selling Out, which is the story of Goose Island, um, a book from a Chicago. I think he's a journalist. Um, do you like uh, how worried do you get when you send out these beers? Because that was a thing for them, is is that all these beers spoiling in route to um, these competitions? Does that like does does that worry you? Has that happened to you? Like. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it has happened to us. Okay. Um, especially, you know, before we were canning uh, or before we were canning en masse, we're sending bombers that were hand bottling. And, you know, at that point it's the luck of the draw. And most of the negative feedback that we were receiving from competitions when we were came down to probably should have done a better hand, better job hand bottling that. But I mean, you're sitting there with a beer gun, you know, just like homebrewers. And then we, you know, we've sent crowlers and got the same oxidation issues. Uh, so yeah, we've definitely faced that with cans. It's gotten, you know, it's certainly a little bit better, but at the same time, we don't have control over that beer in transit. And so we don't know what extremes it's subjected to, you know, obviously you hope your beer holds up when it's on a warm shelf, but you know, the extreme temperature changes are going to impact it. I know the the guild always sends a truck out to GABF every year to uh, yeah. ensure at least you know your guys' beer, yep. they, whatever they can control. Obviously, yep. they'll be able to to control it for you. You mentioned you were a lawyer, and it looks like you had a uh, a nice little C and D about five years ago from a uh, uh, techno hip hop duo called LMFAO. What? <laughs> I was yeah. just reading about that. <laughs> So I got I can't wait. What what can we talk about this? Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of what's actually written down. So I w- I'll start off by saying that I worked with um, Shorty Brown. Uh, Sheila Eddy was our attorney. We called her Shorty Brown um, because I, anytime something gets that out of hand with intellectual property law, I bring in someone to help me. Um, it was actually my focus in law school, but it's not my practice area. So I brought in Sheila Eddy, um, who was with Smith Hoey, and she was amazing to work with. Um, and the opposing counsel in this case was a gentleman named Tilo Agta. 
And I got a letter from Tilo Agta from 10th floor, 100 Wall Street and about shit my pants. Uh, <laughs> you know, anytime. Yeah, I've been sitting in a basement. My office at this point was in a basement below the brew house. You know, I've got five gallon Homer buckets where water drips from the brew system onto my desk. And 100 Wall Street, 10th floor letter crosses my desk. I'm like, wow, we're screwed. Um, but Tilo Akta turned out to be an incredible opposing counsel to work with. And Sheila Eddy was great. Uh, they basically had uh, just a battle royale of words, which most of, most of that's public. We published a lot of it on our own Facebook. And at the end of the day, I can say that we settled amicably-ish, um, amic- <laughs> amicably enough. And the beer is still called uh, LMFAO Stout. Uh, it was Let Me Fetch an Oatmeal Stout is actually where it came from. It was a crowdsourced name. Uh, I can't get into too much of the details in between, but it was one of those situations where a cease and desist was actually kind of fun to work through. And those are very, very rare in our industry. Uh, I, I wish the rest of ours had been like that. With a lot of breweries going very uh, close to pop culture, pop culture references, and taking a lot from pop culture, you do have going to the New England IPAs, No Dignity, um, which is uh, – oh, God, I can't think of his um, name. Um, but it's Chuck. It's Derek, Di- it's, it's Derek Dial. Um, so uh, Derek Dial is actually downstairs playing music right now um, in the new tap room. Um, he's one. He's part of the band playing. And he's also uh, the gentleman that helps me with our graphic design because I can't draw. I just manipulate images. And so I had Derek draw – a, uh, a character that reminded people of a character from a very popular movie, but had Derek's face. Ah. <laughs> and so um, Derek is doing the, uh, the truffle shuffle on the can of no dignity. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the guy that played Chunk is actually an entertainment lawyer in California now. So if he's watching this, I'll look for the letter on Monday. <laughs> Uh, UPS is going a little slow. You'll probably get it Wednesday. <laughs> probably get it in about Perfect. three weeks. <laughs> Wendy, yeah, we, you got to... We... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to hand it off to Wendy. So my question is actually um, a little more on a personal nature by meaning my personal nature. Um, you've mentioned the your club members quite a few times, and I have quite a few friends in Muskegon who I know are members and... Um, so every, I've wanted to be a member for so long, but I've have a job where I could not take the day after Thanksgiving off ever. <laughs> this is the first year I'm going to be able to do that. Are you guys still planning on doing that this year? That's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> and I, I might have to give a non-answer. Uh, so <laughs> I have spent the last several weeks in the midst of everything else, getting everything else ready here, trying to figure out exactly what we're doing for the club this year. Um, We were trying to, we do different swag every year. We've never done mugs per se. You know, we do growlers last year. It was Stanley coolers. We just try and pick cool. Yeah. The cooler. We (laughs) pick cool stuff that basically I find something I want and then I get everyone else to subsidize it for me. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, this year, We had our entire team and some of our uh, really loyal club members all brainstormed and came up with a bunch of ideas. And apparently there's a worldwide pandemic and it's hard to get things right now. (laughs) So, so far, I actually don't even have an idea of what our club swag is going to be. And um, then trying to figure out what signups on Black Friday look like. uh, So I'm just kind of beating around the bush at this point. We're going to do something. And it will hopefully be Black Friday. I just don't know what yet. Uh, but you know a guy, so I'm sure we can make something happen. Just I've already taken that. the day off of work. I okay. did it as soon as that girl that was keeping me from being able to take the day off <laughs> left. I put my <laughs> put awesome. my request in. Yeah, I, my hope is that it, it it will not be what we've done in the past. Um, we do have Graham, um, uh, Grandma. For those who don't know, uh, grandma is in barrels below me. Very, very small amount this year. All journeyman barrels, which I'm pretty pumped about. Um, So that's going to be a very small limited release that will hopefully be Black Friday with the club. Um, But we just we're trying to figure it out. I mean, keeping everyone safe is priority one. Right. So but yeah, fingers crossed we will do something. I just don't know what it looks like yet. 
I will be stalking you to figure out All right. what's going on. Seriously, shoot me an email. We'll, <laughs> we'll make something happen. <laughs> so that, that was really my, <laughs> my big question. Nick, yeah. you, get, you got something for uh, Mr. Brower over here? You're welcome to the show. Glad you could uh, make it. Yeah, what you drinking? Is he's on mute? Yeah, <laughs> a little there slow. Good eye there, Nick. Thanks for paying yeah, attention. No, you're welcome. Uh, I got the Listerman's <laughs> Haterade. Oh, you still have a Haterade left? I still got a Haterade left. Oh. And then I still have not much left, but Harpoon Flannel Friday from uh, from Good Vermont. Beer. Yeah. Oh yeah. I got a couple Harpoons beers still left from our from our trip about a year ago. No, oh, no Dunkin' Pumpkin. <laughs> no. You you know what I. I was not they didn't have the Dunkin' Pumpkin when I was there. And this was like and it was like in October. Wasn't too crazy about the stop. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It was okay, but nothing to really run home and write about. But. Gotcha. All right. So I guess I guess my next question for you is we're we're kind of going through and I kind of want to be a little like what's your you, you're drinking a, a non-alcoholic right now, but what's your Michael's um, go to style, go to beers. Like, what, what if I open up your fridge and I move all the Pigeon Hill beers aside? What am I going to find? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of sad, but generally, LaCroix. Um, <laughs> at, at home, <laughs> I don't drink a ton at home. Um, okay. When I do, it's, it's frequently rum. Uh, just well, then, because. You what, know, what rum oh, are you drinking? Your, yeah, what's your favorite rum? Yeah. Uh, my favorite rum of all time, I don't know if we can get in the States right now, but it's a uh, Brugal Siglo de Oro. Um, so Brugal is Dominican Republic. Um, their Siglo de Oro is, um, it, it's a blend, but uh, I think it ranges from eight to 15 years. Um, you drink, you drink it neat. Just a really, really, really nice sipping rum. Um, otherwise, uh, it's mostly Brugal, to be honest with you. Um, so Dominican rums. Uh, the the reason I ask, just uh, I'll, I'll let you continue in just a second. The reason I ask is, is that the guy who runs our map, which uh, we are um, about to launch the closed beta for Android in about one week. You guys can sign up over at mibeermap.com. Find all the Michigan breweries. Find out if they've got patios, if they're dog friendly, if they do things like distilled spirits, or if they're a brew pub so they have guest taps. Again, you can sign up at mibeermap.com. Um, our map guy is a professional rum taster so he goes to like the caribbean islands and goes somewhere and like wherever the gabf for rum is down there uh is a judge so and like that's that's always a fun story to tell because he found our current map which you can still find the web version of the map at mibeermap.com because his wife loves beer so he was able to kind of like figure out which ones had spirits, which ones didn't by mapping out breweries with uh, distilled licenses or brew pubs. That's awesome. So uh, what I do have other beers in my fridge, uh, common ones, and I'm, I'm not trying to shut out any of my great friends, but um, 31 Plains from Stormcloud is a major go-to for me. My wife is 228 triple from Stormcloud. So anytime that we can get up there or get friends to come down, um, we've got storm cloud in the fridge and then our boys over in Allendale trail point. Um, we do a lot of beer trades, so we frequently have SIPA, um, in the fridge, but, uh, otherwise it, for me, I prefer to go out and just have beer outside of my house. Um, you know, the house I'm generally trying to get work done or go to sleep because I'm either at the office or at home trying to sleep. So, uh, it, I love just going out and having beer from the source, um, one place I'm hoping to get really soon that I haven't been in a while is over to Cedar Springs. I could use some good German style in my life. But. Cedar Springs is uh, really, really solid. I always check them out when they're at the beer festivals because they always bring really, really good beer. But, you know, you didn't really mention what kind of style. So, like, if you went oh, yeah. to, if you went to say, North Center Brewing over in Northville, Michigan, just south of Baseline Road over on Center, uh, Center Street, what kind of style are you going to look for? Um, you know, it's going to depend on the day, the weather, my mood, but, uh, common styles I'm looking for, I'm going to be looking for a good clean pills. I'm going to be looking for, uh, and this sounds kind of silly. Uh, we're about to release ours, uh, but it's named after me because it's my favorite style. Vienna lagers. They are not that common. Um, but, 
Uh, for those who haven't heard, Mikey's little Wiener beer is about to be released. Um, <laughs> it's named after me uh, because it is my favorite style. And then I always love a really good, clean, on the drier side IPA. So, um, you know, like Drippa, when Drippa was released, that was kind of a revelation for me. Um, we're not going like brute levels of dry, but uh, get a little bit of rice as an adjunct to kind of clean it out, lighten it up. Uh, our Rennie uh, follows that same mold. And so anytime I can find something like that, I'm really excited. Um, yeah, I, I generally gravitate towards classic IPAs and then clean lagers. Now, speaking of rums, as you brought up a little earlier, um, I noticed that definitely with the the tap list is at both the tap room and I guess downstairs that you guys have more than just beer, um, yeah. which obviously we see at a lot of breweries that are moving towards other things. So I guess talk to us about some of the other other offerings that you have. Absolutely. Um, right now we have to-go bottles only of uh, Red 8 uh, white and barrel-aged rum. And that's another go-to rum for me is the Red 8 barrel-aged rum, um, which we just have in our tap room. Uh, then we have uh, our vodka lemonade. Uh, so we have a tart cherry vodka lemonade that's on draft. We don't do, I mean, there's no like glass pours, no shots. Um, everything is either by the draft or by the bottle to go. Um, we're, we're not trying to be a bar. We're just trying to have offerings for everybody. And then we also have a variety of wine that we rotate through. And all of that is in partnership with uh, Black Star Farms. Um, we've got some great relationships with different Michigan wineries. We're lucky to have so many good ones. Uh, but uh, we found that Black Star just kind of fit the, the Pigeon Hill mold. Is there is there a reason why you guys didn't maybe go into your own um, wine making or cider making or anything like that? Or was it just easier to kind of collab well, with another brand? Legally speaking, we are actually required to make our own wine. And so we do. We just don't have it right now. Uh, we have uh, – oh, crap. What do we call it? Well, uh, well, pigeon, pigeon, pigeon Pinot or something like that, which is actually pretty good. It came from a kit. While, while you're uh, doing – like why are you legally required to make a wine? In order to do the bulk transfers, there was uh, a kind of a large – I almost said brew haha, but I guess it was a large wine haha uh, about a year and a half ago where a lot of breweries were bringing in bulk wine or bottled wine and slapping their own label on it and saying, look, we made this. This is ours. And they were making – they were doing no production whatsoever. Um as a result, liquor control cracked down. There was actually a law change. And now we are allowed to bring in shiners or unlabeled bottles, but we also have to produce something. And so um, for us, we, our guys were interested in making wine. It's mostly just a matter of time. And the same with distillation. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of time. So we have a still that we use um, every now and again, and it's, and it's fun, um, but we just don't have the time to focus on that. And so like our wine comes from a kit uh, and we, we do make wine just to make sure that we're satisfying the legal requirements. But we also know that we can buy better wine from other folks. Is, is wine what you have to make or can it be something else that falls under a winemaker's license, like uh, a mead or. Yeah, we could, could do a turn... mead or a cider. We've done cider before. <laughs> turn Welch's right. grape juice into wine. Maybe might be an easy way to get around that. So one of oh, our guys Jesus. actually did that <laughs> and then back sweetened it with Splenda oh. and won an award. Oh, that's oh, amazing. <laughs> this is like, this is like eight years ago. <laughs> I will definitely have to, <laughs> to find that. That is for sure. Um, what is uh, like for, for pigeonhole for pigeonholed pigeon hill. Pigeon Come on. Come on. Um, Don't pigeonhole us like that, man. I know. It's <laughs> that's the first thing I thought of. It like it wow. just like rolled right off my tongue. Um, nice one, bro. For for Pigeon Hill upcoming, like you obviously you just opened up your auxiliary tap room. Um so that's gonna be kind of your, you know, your your next what's what's the next step for you guys? That's a great question. Uh, Thank you. I don't. I don't. I've been know. doing this a while. <laughs> you, you sound very skilled. Um, I, I, no bullshit. I don't know. Um, I've got some ideas, and I'll just kind of spitball here, but don't, don't hold me to any of it. Um, 
obviously I mentioned that, you know, we're looking at tank space and it's becoming a concern for us. You know, we've, we've looked at out of state distribution, we've entered out of state distribution. We're looking at more options and now we're seeing the market hopefully rebound here in Michigan, hopefully stay that way for a while. Um, so definitely looking at some potential tank um, expansion. Um, also looking at new brand expansion. We just launched Cafe Disco, um, our most award-winning beer. Waltzer gets buzzed. I could barely give this stuff away. You know, and the beer is solid. Those that drink it love it. It was just a matter of getting people to pick up the cans and that fell on me. It was bad branding to start with. Um, so looking at, you know, our brands and rebranding, kind of taking a fresh eye. Um, one of my distributors told me to quit putting so many inside jokes into all of our branding. <laughs> and uh, so what I've started doing is putting inside jokes that I hope other people get. Because uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, we're still doing it for ourselves. Um, so again, introducing new brands, some fresh branding. And if the world doesn't go to complete dumpster fire shit in the next six months, um, hopefully opening some more retail spaces. I, I want to ask before we kind of let you go, because branding, I think, is one of the biggest issues when you have amazing, solid, award winning beer that people just do not give two shits about. Um, yeah. You know, I I I. You guys are all going to make fun of me, and let's go for it right now. Um, but the <laughs> the alt beer over at Royal Oak Brewery. Oh, of course. <laughs> GABF medal winning alt beer. But you see alt beer, and you're like, what the fuck is that? I don't care. Give me the you know the red because I know what Achilles is. Or when we talked with Sagatuck, and they used to have their ESB, and they had to change their name to uh, Dead Bear. Or something, or not Dead Bear. Um, some third bear. Um, because everyone's afraid of the phrase ESB. Like, how do you go about with, um, you know, trying to change people's opinions? Because we're we're in a craft beer renaissance that's still been going on for the past five years. Like when we started this show, we've almost doubled the amount of breweries in the state. Um, how, like, how do we still reach those people who are scared of those? Because they're ca- craft beer fans. They're they're yeah. gonna go to craft breweries. They're gonna brewery hop. They're gonna use the MI Beer Map uh, app when it comes out. But like, how do you get them to like these beers that are very, very approachable? You know, my hope, I don't think I actually have, I don't have the label here. Um, we, we just had that exact conversation with Mikey's Little Wiener, um, Wiener, whatever, uh, because I wanted, I insisted that the label say Vienna Lager. And we had a large internal discussion, uh, maybe we'll even call it a debate over whether consumers would be interested in something that said Vienna Lager or if that would scare them away because they don't know what the hell it is. You know, what's a Vienna Lager? That's weird. Um, And so our thought was, well, if we can put something that sounds silly, it sounds funny, but it's got, you know, the label for it is mid-century modern, it's eye-catching, and then you slap Vienna Lager on it with some descriptors, hopefully that'll draw them in. It'll get them past going, I don't know what the hell that says, to thinking, I'll try that. And then they'll learn, oh, you know what? I like all beers. I like Vienna Lagers because they caught my eye with something that I understood. Well, how do you how do you get past that? Because Vienna Lager is one of the top selling craft beers out there, which is Boston, you know, Sam Adams. Um, Yingling. Yingling. I thought that Yingling. was an amber. That's what a Vienna Lager is. It's is it? an amber lager. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but people don't like, they see Vienna Lager, they have no idea what that means, but they should, you know, I mean, it's, it is a, I would say what a quintessential American style. Um, you know, it's an alt beer, you know, it, we had an alt beer when we opened, no one knew what it was when they drank it, they loved it, but they didn't want to order it because they didn't understand it. And yeah. So, but I think that's, that's where you go to look at the marketing for Alaskan because Alaskan Amber is an alt beer and it, doesn't say alt beer on it. It says amber. So yeah. everyone knows what an amber is because, you know, amber obviously coincides with red. So they think, you know, majorly, uh, they'll think Killian's, um, Amber Bach, like these beers. But if you just said alt beer, they'll be like, you know, like I want a lot of people, Oh, I'll ask an amber. I'm like, Oh, it's an alt beer. I like it. So, I mean, Alaskan has a pretty crazy, um, I mean, They've got notoriety. They've got, you know, just people sit in Alaska and they're like, oh, it's Alaskan. Of course it's good. Um, for those that are, you know, say Royal Oak with their alt beer, I don't think they need to not call it an alt beer. 
I think they just need to find another way to get consumers to grab it and then explain, look, it's an all beer. Like, I think the consumers, they, they don't need to be slammed in the face, like bad consumer, bad. This is an all beer. You should drink it. But they should be led to understand, look, you're drinking an all beer. All right. Well, before we let you go, I know Wendy's got one more question for you. So it's funny that you say that about the branding, because the beer that I have to open up next is actually from um, it's Deathstalker from Burial Burial Beer Company in Asheville. And I literally asked my friend to go to Asheville to get it for me because of the picture on the can. So it, I had no idea what it tasted like. I knew it was an IPA. That was it. I was like, I want to try this beer because I really like that artwork. So it, it really does matter. Absolutely. You're going to love my new segment. You know, if uh, no <laughs> dignity works because it's somebody else's face on Chunk, since your name is Michael, Mikey, have you with a little inhaler? And uh, you could just, you know, roll out a whole faux foonies. <laughs> For those of you listening on the podcast, he just showed us in his, his inhaler. Um, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we have uh, your Vienna Lager uh, updated label we'll be seeing on the TTP website real, real soon. <laughs> um, Michael, you guys are located in Muskegon, Uh Talk to us where you guys located. How can we find you on social medias? All that fun stuff. Absolutely. Um, We are located downtown Muskegon. We've got two locations. Uh, Our original tap room is on Western Avenue, right next to the LC Walker Arena. Uh, Our new tap room is club only this weekend, potentially next weekend, but will soon be open to the public. It's in the big ass blue building on Shoreline Drive that says Pigeon Hill Brewing Company. That's our production facility. And on the social medias, uh, Pigeon Hill Brew. Uh, so Twitter backslash, Facebook backslash, Insta backslash, Pigeon Hill Brew. That's, that's where you'll find us. That's so nice that's, when all that works that way. I do what I can, <laughs> man. I'm not good at a lot, but that I figured out. <laughs> all right. Well, that's going to do it. Uh, go check out uh, Pigeon Hill Brewing. Of course, they do distro. That's why I got those cans right from my local corner store. You could probably find them at stores like Zatuna Liquor over in Rochester Hills, just south of M59 on uh, Rochester Road. Uh, so go say hi to Jack. Spend lots of money. And uh, we will be right back in about 10 minutes with the Better on Draft podcast.